Hello everyone and welcome to our panel discussion on plug and charge and what this emerging technology can do to enhance the EV driving experience. I'm Nino Dikara, founder of Electric Autonomy Canada, and I'm delighted to moderate today's discussion, which is sponsored by Autocrypt. Autocrypt is a mobility cyber security provider dedicated to the safety of new transportation. Its solutions secure the rapidly evolving framework of smart mobility from start to finish, right across the connected vehicle, whether it be connecting to a network, to other vehicles, your own smartphone device, the electricity grid, or as we're discussing in this case, a public EV charger across switch data as well as electrons flow. We're grateful to Autocrypt for their support. Well, public EV charging is set to get easier with the introduction of plug and charge technology. But what is plug and charge and how will it make for a more seamless EV charging experience? And what are the barriers to wide scale adoption? Well, that's what we'll be tackling today with a great panel of experts. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Mike Wensloff, Senior Program Manager, Electric Vehicles, BC Hydro. Darren Scott, Product Manager, E-Mobility, Siemens Canada. Sean H.J. Cho, President for North America, Autocrypt. And Kush, Kush O'Brien, Product Manager, Taken, McCann Charging Infrastructure at Porsche Canada. Well, welcome panelists, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, each panelist to uh, introduce themselves. And so uh, if we kick off uh, with, with Kush, uh, first of all. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nino. Uh, my name is Kush. I'm the product manager for Taycan, Macan, and Charging Infrastructure here at Porsche Cars Canada. Um, the theme with all of that is the electrification side. I have a picture behind me of an older Macan generation or the current one, uh, which is an internal combustion vehicle, but that's also moving electric. So really just focusing on how to bring these products to market in Canada, uh, the electrified ones, and then the charging infrastructure that supports them. I'm heavily focused on the public side of that. So whether that's destination charging level two or highway charging on level three, uh, building that customer experience via app, via an online portal, and of course, uh, plug and charge like we're talking about today. Terrific, thanks Kush. And uh, if we go to Mike next. Thanks Nino and hi everybody. I'm Mike Wenslaff, I'm at BC Hydro in Vancouver. And so BC Hydro is one of the largest electric utilities in Canada with about 2 million customers, 5 million end users. Um, we're a, a big supporter of transportation electrification and in BC, we have very high uh, EV adoption numbers. And my role is, is looking after the customer experience of our fast charging network, as well as uh, residential charging. And so uh, we have about 70 odd fast charging station sites in BC, around 100 DC fast chargers. And so I'm um, going to be talking today about the customer experience aspects of, of how plug and charge can, can help. Terrific. Thanks, Mike. And Darren, over to you. Thanks, Nino. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I'm uh, Darren Scott, uh, with Siemens Canada. I am the product manager and business developer for Siemens AC and DC uh, charging infrastructure. Uh, Siemens Canada manufactures a large portfolio of electrical infrastructure equipment, and we've been working very hard to help uh, Canada meet its electrification goals with all of our equipment. Great stuff. Thanks, Darren. And Sean. Hello, I'm Sean Cho, I'm president of Autocrypt. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining for um, today's event. It's uh, my pleasure joining this webinar to um, discuss with industry professionals one of the hottest topic in electric vehicle and charging services. I trust if you listen to um, this conversation for the next an hour and um, after all, we will have a way better understanding of what we are, what PNC is and what you are need to prepare for PNC implementation is as one of the industry players of the actors of the ecosystem. So with um, limited time frame, if there's anything we didn't cover during the session, please um, let us know anytime after the session or during the Q&A so we can pretty much support everything to answer and clear your um, questions. Thank you very much. 
That's great, yeah. and, and thank you, Sean. And uh, yeah, and just to highlight, we'll probably be using the term P, as, as, as Sean did. We'll be using the term P and C as the short form for 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 plug and charge because it does relate to a specific uh, form of technology. So just a note for the audience there. Right. Well, let's let's crack into the discussion. And um, Kush, maybe we can uh, kick off with yourself. And P Porsche obviously puts a lot of effort into creating the perfect car experience. And so, could you chat us through? some of the challenges with public EV chargers, because obviously that's now part of the vehicle experience as a Porsche owner when you, you've got to interact with these chargers in a public way, um, and the way they connect with vehicles today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the first ones are the obvious ones that, you know, we were solving as an industry very quickly. One was charging power and then the availability. So charging power is increasing. Uh, you're seeing more and more 150, 350 kilowatt stations, faster charging, faster charging vehicles like, like the Taycan. Um, the second, of course, is density. You're seeing more chargers come up. You have Enercan installing more. You have Petro Canada, Electrify Canada, Flow, et cetera, and a whole lot of networks out there. So those two big problems that everyone talks about, there's some good solutions in place. When it comes down to the user experience, that's you know, a new frontier where, where PNC you know, provides an opportunity. Um, I use this every time I do any kind of a talk. This is my EV folder in my iPhone. You'll see there that there's nine apps. There's a second page too. Um, I'm, I'm in, the, in the industry, I drive an EV, so it's, it's common for me to go multiple places to charge, but the average EV driver I find will have at least a couple of apps to access and pay for charging. Those apps could have multiple wallets where you have money stored in each one. And by way of that, you know, if you were to lend your car to a partner or a friend, and they show up to a charging station, it's not the same as filling up on gas. They have to open up that app, make sure they have a, a user account perhaps, and then go through that process. It can be a little bit clunky and cumbersome, um, especially from the premium angle where you know we try and make sure our customers have a seamless experience, whether it's at home, in the driver's seat, or at the dealership. And uh, that is a bit of a challenge we as an industry have to solve now when it comes to public charging infrastructure. How do we have the customer have a seamless experience when they charge at charging station A, or B. Um, and I think that's kind of the potential we're, we're talking about today. Yeah, that, that's great. It's almost like the, uh, the holy grail that we're after of that seamless uh, experience between those, uh, those charging spots. Um, Definitely. So great. And, and so Mike, could you, on that regard of seamless experience, could, could you speak about the extent to which we have a range of other EV charging networks in Canada, obviously beyond BC Hydro, um, and how roaming agreements work and how they've gone sort of some way to, you know, helping with this experience. Yeah, and I, I guess uh, really roaming is a, a precursor or prerequisite to this conversation that it, it starts um, bringing um, EV networks together in terms of, um, you know, sharing commonality in terms of, as Kush said, the your, your wallet or your stored value in one account um, or one network account you can use for another one. So you're not having to store um, you know, a wallet in you know, BC Hydro and Flow and ChargePoint necessarily. So right now in Canada, there's a, a couple um, roaming arrangements. So with, with BC Hydro, we can roam between Flow and ChargePoint and, and Green Lots is in the works. I know um, in, in Eastern Canada, Circuit Electric, um, and Quebec also has a, a couple of roaming agreements in place. So there's a so this is really the baby step to the the future concept where it is very seamless. It still requires the the user to open up an app or get out a RFID card, but that's the the first step. And so that allows for the communication between networks. Um, but it also like kind of is is showing challenges like privacy and security. So in, in Canada, we have more stringent privacy laws. And so if people are going to the US or back and forth, other, other networks that gets, it starts to get a little bit trickier because of how we, we have some data residency um, situations here. So that'll be part of the aspect too, is, is can roaming concepts be lever leveraged to plug and charge and then layering in privacy and security as well um, into that mix. So we can have automakers and networks wanna um, maintain that, that, that 
re customer relationship, but you also at the same side, we want to make it easy for the EV drivers to um, help with adoption and remove barriers. So there's a, it's an interesting mix of challenges of, of data and privacy and relationships and, uh, and brand in the mix as well. And Mike, perhaps you could uh, invite you just to expand on the the, uh, the, the data and, and privacy risk there. Now, this is because customers' data is is flowing to networks who they may not have a, a relate an existing relationship, financial relationship with. Is that is that a correct summary? Yeah. So with the the roaming today, there isn't a um, for instance, Nino. If you're using a a you have a, a flow account and you go over to charge point, your personal information isn't being transferred. So that um, and so it's a, it's a bit of a, like a pointer to your account, but your information isn't being shared, although your, your, the, the transaction session is being completed. So there are some, some building blocks there conceptually that you know, ideally we can leverage, um, but you know, plug and charge is the next layer where it's really you know, it's deeper system to system communication. Great, thanks Mike for, for outlining that. Well, there's, um... There is a protocol agreed upon by the International Organization for Standards, um, which would be, be great to introduce, introduce our audience to, called ISO 15118. Um, and this, this standard enables, or, or, or really is a framework for electric vehicles uh, to communicate with the electrical grid um, and, and more. Um, and, and so, Sean, could you explain a bit more about ISO 15? 118 and exactly what it's about and what it does. Sure. Um, the ISO 15118 is the um, international standard full name of a vehicle to grid communication interface that defines the communications for charging electric vehicles between charging station and vehicle itself. So which allows electric vehicles and charging station to exchange information securely, as well as to organize a charging schedule. So what is meant by a charging schedule is through a specific system build level solution, the vehicle through the charging station could work with the electric grid and pick the most optimal time to charge with the considering enterprising of electricity and stress on the electric network. Um, to be more precise, um, ISO standard defines the communication protocols to prevent any gaps or disorder in data exchange between electric vehicles and charging station and also takes care of both wired and wireless means of communications. To take a closer look at the standard, it, um, it is a structured with several parts. So the part one, part one provides outlining the overall goals of standard by defining the use cases and terms, while part two defines um, the messages and technical requirements to realize the use cases defined in part one. So one probably say that this part is the core of the standard because it lays the foundation through, um, through which the use cases will be realized. So part three takes care of the defining the physical and data link layer communication as outlined in the previous part. Part four divide, divides into performance tests for um, part two, part two specified requirements, while part five is referred to conformance test for part three specified requirements. And part six and seven, they were um, eventually merged into part one and part two. So currently it's out of commissions. Part A is a part of the standard that defines the technical requirements for wireless communication using IEEE, IEEE 802 um, Wi-Fi technology on the lowermost physical and data link layers. Part nine provides conformance tests for use cases defined in part A, and 20 actually is an updated version of part two. Um, that adds features like wireless charging, bi-directional transfer, et cetera. So one important point to consider is that um, 1815 18 only compliant electric vehicles can charge only at 20 compliant station and vice versa. Electric vehicles or station compliant only with part two can be used only with each other. The standard also enables a feature called um, the plug and charge, which is the main topic we are discussing today. The PNC is a feature it's secured by design and secure communication between actors and fundamental. So in order to support PNC and other services created in the PNC and its charging environment, um, ISO standard with um, 15.118 is the key. So with this in mind, ISO standard brings us more than one step closer to a truly smart 
convenient and safe secure electric charging service and enables to create more enjoyable and use case in the overall ecosystems. For the structure um, layout of the um, ISO standard, I actually have a presentation material that explains detail. Um, so I can, by some later, um, I can share you um, for the, um, the detail and their understanding. That's great. Th thanks. Thanks very much, Sean. And I, th I think that would be uh, be helpful for, uh, I'm sure, many, many in the audience to to actually be able to visualize some of the details that, that you outline. But just to pick up on one of the points that you highlighted, and correct me if I uh, understood this uh, well, is that the, the vehicle needs to be PNC plug and charge compliant and the charger needs to be plug and charge compliant as well. It only works if both the car and the charger are, are PNC compliant. Did I understand that correctly? Oh, yes, right. So the ISO standard is between um, the charging station and the vehicle. And the vehicle and the back end server, um, there is a, like a different protocol called OCPP. So it sounds like a two different things we need to discuss. Cool, great. Okay, thanks, Sean. Well, let, let's talk specifically about um, what plug and charge will do to improve things from an EV driver experience. So let, let's let's get to that core of uh, creating that uh, you know re really enhancing uh, it, it from uh, that point of view. Uh, Darren's uh, Siemens provides EV charging hardware, among many other things that, that drivers physically interact with when, when charging. So from a user experience point of view, what difference would plug and charge make when a, a driver rolls up to a charger and gets ready to charge? Thanks, Nino, that's a, that's a great question. It would make a very big difference. Um, as, as Kush and uh, Mike have described already, it's a pretty complicated process for the EV charger user, there's multiple apps, multiple RFID cars, multiple networks, uh, making it difficult for the EV driver when they're going to charge, they have to identify what they need to use. So really it simplifies the entire process by allowing the car to self-identify with the charger and it makes it really seamless and easy uh, for the customer to be able to charge a vehicle at that point. Um, so it eliminates all the need for RFID cards and apps as the car does self-identification. Not only for the individual EV user, but when you think about from a fleet operator perspective, where they have multiple vehicles and multiple drivers, if the vehicles are self-identifying, uh, it eliminates all the management of the RFID cards with the users and that sort of thing. So at the end of the day, it really simplifies things and makes things really easy for the EV driver as well as the fleet managers. Thanks, Darren. Maybe you could just expand on that notion a bit from a, a fleet manager, fleet operator's point of view, and just uh, just uh, sort of unpack that a, a little bit further. Obviously, it's a big uh, a big area and a big issue for fleet fleet operators. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a great point. I mean, most people we think about the EV driver themselves and how it simplifies the process for them. But if you think of the fleet manager, they have you know multiple vehicles. They have a fleet of a hundred cars. Uh, EV vehicles have also you know maybe two hundred drivers, and each of those drivers currently would need an RFID card or access to an app in order to authenticate the, uh, the charging session in order to start that for the, the, you know, the fleet vehicle. And there's always an opportunity for misuse as well. When, it, when you move to plug and charge, the vehicle becomes a self-identifier. So it sort of becomes the app and, and the RFID card in itself and identifies with the charger, it communicates the charger, yes, I'm eligible to charge, this is the account, and then it eliminates the need for the RFID cards with the drivers and all the, you know, the management comes from the driver's side. So it really simplifies things on their side. Instead of managing all the RFID cards, they're just managing the vehicles themselves. Great, Th thanks Darren. Would any uh, panelists like to add to this, uh, um, the points that Darren's raised from a, um, from a driver perspective and some of the advantages uh, from, from, oper from an operations point of view as well? I can add a bit of the customer um, experience on our end, right? Um, like Darren mentioned, uh, the app RFID is all rolled into this handshake between a car and a charger that the customer doesn't have to really uh, walk up to, whether it's a fleet operator, a driver, for us, a customer. Um, COVID was a really good example of this because there was the early stages in 2020 where a customer wanted to take their car and plug in at a charging station that everyone had touched before them. And it was in a public space and there was a screen and sanitizer and hand wipes were, were an issue. Um, it it kind of provided this sort of launching pad for plug in charge to say, oh, hey, when you drive a Tycon, yes, you have to touch the plug for sure. But you don't have to go on the screen. You don't have to plug in your digits somewhere else. You don't have to open up phones. It's just grab one thing, you plug it in and your car will authenticate you with the charger. Electrons will flow and you can go back, sit inside, you know, 
watch some YouTube videos and you're all good to go. Um, that simple experience, that simplicity is something that people I think are seeking. Um, and uh, that's, that's one of the really, really key benefits. You don't have to go and do any stuff. You can be mindlessly just plug in a plug, get in your car and you're good to go. Thanks. That, that, that's really helpful. The um, j just make, making things frictionless, I think, is uh, one of the one of the, the, obviously the key issues in business. And uh, um, yeah, I think you've, 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 between those points, uh, Darren and Kush, you've highlighted it well. Um, so, uh, Sean, maybe uh, could you explain the plug and charge protocol and in, in a little bit more detail in terms of how it creates a communication protocol between the actors and, and Mike was highlighting some of these when he was talking about the roaming uh, side of things uh, but really how it creates a protocol between vehicles chargers and, and payment systems for them for them all to work together sure um, the key technology in PNC is the uh, not the like hardware charging station but it is more about uh, the backend authentication system based on the public key infrastructure because the PNC requires secure authentication mechanism for um, secure communications. Then during the process, validation and authentication between each actors in the system are the key. And that has to be set before any kind of meaningful data exchange. Moreover, um, this complex process happens in the background without the need for interaction with the actual service users. So the only process the user is required to interact is happens uh, when the person creates a contract with the service providers. During this process, the user shares vehicle and credit card information for the payment with the charging station operator or mobility operator. Um, the mobility operator then verifies the existence and authenticity of the vehicle through vehicle um, through the verified vehicle identifications. Then a user contract is created and contract is controlled as a kind of certificate and it is installed in this like certificate provisioning pool and used to verify um, the contract of users when the users actually use the charging station. In charging station operator perspective, identify the verify and the vehicle ID is the first step. And the most important information needed to um, verify is if the vehicle user has a contract and if the contract is valid, so the payment process can be successfully completed. And the vehicle perspective, the most important thing is the authenticity of the charging station and the operator. And this is checked by verifying um, the certificate of the charging station all the way to the root certificate. Um, the, the charging process is more complex because that involves different charging tariffs and charging varies by charging operators. So the information about the charging rate and tariff is downloaded through the charging station. The vehicle then approves the, the rate and amount of the electricity. The last part is the um, authentication by the vehicle of how much is charged by signing a type of digital receipt and providing it to the charging station operator and mobility operator to verify the amount of charged electricity. So we are dealing with a bunch of private critical information which are value, valuable. So um, that has to be protected from the potential risk and attacks and any breaches or manipulation. So this all has to be operated in a secure um, communication environment. And in the very same time, um, that also has to be like monitored 24 seven uh, to make sure everything is in the system is working okay and safe. Great, thanks Sean for that, for that explanation. And, and so you, you touched on the point there that it's really a, it's not necessarily a hardware issue, it's more of a software issue in enabling plug and charge. And again, did I, am I yes, summarize? For, for the backend authentication system, how do we itself that might require a certain point of you know, considerations, but more importantly, I like to say it in the secure, security perspective, the backend system for authentication and validation is the key. Okay, cool, great, thank you. Well, right now, only a few cars are plug and charge capable, the Porsche Taycan being one of them, uh, and the Ford Mustang Mach-E, uh, Honda Ionic 5, the Lucid Air, and uh, Rivian RT1 being examples of others. Um, so on this point, Kush, you know, perhaps you can give us some insight into how the vehicles handle this part of the communication with certificates and obviously picking up from Sean's explanation. Um, obviously, you know, more from a Porsche and Volkswagen perspective, of course. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think I think Sean described it well that there's a lot of stakeholders at play here, right? You have, of course, the vehicle, you have the charger, and um, what's you know very not really North American term, the mobility service provider. All are acting in this in this space. Um, what I like to use as the mobility service provider, that's the account you have with some kind of brand that lets you access the charger. So you mentioned Flow, ChargePoint, um, Electrify Canada. Those mobility service providers happen to also be the charging operators. But in some parts of the world, those could be two different people. Your app could be a different brand than the charger you're using. So I just wanted to, to lay the land there. All the way on the vehicle side, um, it starts with producing the vehicle. So uh, it starts before a customer even has a car. Uh, it needs certificates installed in the actual onboard charger um, of the car. We we heard things like root certificate from Sean earlier, so the car will have one of one of those. There are other certificates like provisioning certificates. I'm not going to go into the technical details because uh, I'm not, I'm not on that production side. But safe to say, before a customer even sees a vehicle, there's certificates installed in that car that allow it to communicate in this landscape in the future. Fast forward a couple of months, the cars come from Germany into Canada, happy customer picks it up. And at that point in time, they of course wanna be able to use charging. At that point, they have to sign up for a charging contract. We use that word contract, right? Um, that could be in today's world, signing up via an app for you know, the Porsche charging service. That's what we call it. That would be the mobility service provider. So the car has certificates and then the customer has a contract with in this case, Porsche, to access charging. Um, customers could have contracts with Flow and ChargePoint, everyone else as well. But in our world, they buy the car from us. They have a contract with us for charging. We offer three years of uh, inclusive charging at, at our partner, Electrify Canada. So you've heard a couple of certificates now, a couple of contracts are all set up. The first time the customer goes to charge at Electrify Canada and they plug in, um, as long as they've ticked the box to say plug in charge is active, as long as they have a credit card on file, it's a, that's a key piece here, they have to have a credit card on file with an account, um, that automatic process starts the first time they plug in. Uh, Sean talked about you know, validating certificates from the charger to its backend, to the car plugging in. Um, that kind of sequence of events is kicked off at that first charging session. And basically what's happening is that handshake happens where the car pulls up and goes, hey, I'm Kush's Tycon. Um, the charger goes, hey, I'm an Electrify Canada charger. Uh, let's exchange certificates and they validate each other basically in, the, in this process. Um, and finally, the electrons flow. And like Sean mentioned at the end of that, there's a record signed by either party to say, hey, this was a valid transaction, a valid charging session. And that bill will now be passed through to you know, the portion charging service for Kush. And he'll get his bill at the end of the month or whenever that happens. So I know it's it's hard to do this without a visual, but of course, we are on the car side. We're on the mobility service provider side. So the, the account the customer has is on Porsche.ca. They drive a Taycan. And when they plug into that, uh, that charger for the first time, when they have their account set up, um, the stuff is flowing in the back end, all, all kind of in the cloud, letting that charger know, hey, I know this car. Um, and this charger is part of a valid network. And they're allowed to do this amongst each other. And the very technical stuff is what allows that to happen without the customer having to check all the boxes, push all the buttons. That's great. Thanks very much, Kush. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's talk on the, the charging side of the equation now. And, and Darren, um, can you speak to how the chargers need to be set up to accommodate this ISO standard? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nino. Uh, so as, as Kush described in great detail and a really good explanation on uh, the car side and the, and the cars, you know, need to communicate to the back end software. And then that's the other pieces of software that's controlling the infrastructure and the chargers that would facilitate the billing, um, the hydro flow, those sorts of things. And in between is the charger. So the charger itself needs to be set up and plug and charge compliant with the hardware as well as the firmware. And as long as it's set up to communicate, you know, uh, facilitate the communication between that car and then that software or the charging network that's uh, allowing the power to flow, uh, that allows for the plug and charge to happen. So as long as those all three of those components, the car itself, the charger can facilitate that communication through the ISO 15118 and the plug and charge and, and that backend software that allows the cars to authenticate and then charge as well. And to, to Sean's earlier point, security needs to be considered in there as well with the data flowing as well. 
And so just a thanks, Dan. So just to follow up on that in regards to the actual connectors, and obviously here in Canada we have CCS and we have Chatmo connectors as well. Um, does a type of connector have any impact on the ability to implement plug and charge? No, no, it shouldn't. As long as it has that communication pin uh, included in the charge handle, then there's no issue. So the charging handle shouldn't make a difference. Okay, that's good, good stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, so Mike, from an uh, operator's point of view, in terms of customer experience, streamlining payments, and, and benefits to, to network operators like yourselves, um, what, what does plug and charge mean? We've touched on a few of these, but I think it'd be good to just to hear you know, very clearly from your point of view as you would see it as an operator. So I guess you know our, our conversation today is you know, what everybody's saying here is the, the utopia of the Tesla integrated ecosystem is what we're trying to apply to everything else, right? So so that's really what we're what we're what we're saying here. And so for um, for the everything everybody else. You know, there's multiple networks, multiple OEMs, um, all trying to come together for for a consistent experience. And so, for um, network operators, EV station owners, you know, it, in the end, it's um, you know, you want you want your your stations to be utilized. You're thinking about them being up. You're thinking about supporting the customer. Um, but here in Canada, we we have a whole mixed mix bag of different hardware and different networks. And then we also have geographic challenges. So we have places where there's no, no very weak cell phone signal. So as an example, so what happens if uh, we're, you know, plug in charge is all set up and, and the, we, there's a weak cell phone signal and you're trying to still accomplish these goals. And so from a network um, owner perspective, it's how do you still support the customer when there's these mixed relationships that they calling calling a call center and how are, how is that supporting if somebody's saying well I have a Porsche account but I can't charge your charger and then you know that these these are layering effective challenges so we're gonna have to work through that um, and then as I mentioned before it's it's kind of building on the roaming concepts of how who has the relationship with who and who is which party is going to have to be responsible for which aspects and taking compatibility and service level, because in the end, from a customer perspective, it's just, I have my car, here's this plug, I wanna plug it in, I just want it to work. I don't wanna to have to run into challenges and problems. And, and so yeah, the, the industry is gonna to have to work through many, many layers, as Sean said, it's like the, the very deep complexity of, of um, system to system interactions and certificates and all that stuff, which the customer doesn't care about. They just want it, want it easy. And you know, our of the industry goal is that we just want to make the pie bigger of of getting as many Canadians into electric vehicles as possible, as soon as possible, as fast as possible. So that it's just working together and removing barriers. Thanks, Mike. And I I, I think that point of uh, there's some degree of complexity, and we need a number of actors to move together. Um, I think that's a you know really good question for, for Sean in that regard. You know, Sean, what, what is required of all the various actors in the ecosystem of, of plug and charge to, to really make this happen at scale so that, as Mike says, drivers can start really getting the benefit and ease of uh, the use of this system. And I think you're on mute there, Sean. Oh, yes. <laughs> So yeah, um, that's a very good question. And um, as we have all the expertise from industry in here, so please um, add me up um, in the end if I'm missing any important point. So PNC, as you know here, um, this is very complex, but very um, comfortable features for both users and service providers. And it provides at the end a value added service on top of a very comfortable user experience. But for this to happen, there are several key um, requirements from um, several players in the ecosystem. The most common requirements from all the parties in the system is establishing their own public infrastructure to provide um, the trust between the different entities and actors. As I previously mentioned, we need to strongly consider the three features of um, cryptography which are required by the standard because the technology involves the grid and electricity um, providers. It is essential to keep the grid safe and secure. 
And there are several aspects we need to think of. First of all, the PNC root certificate system is at the top of the certification ladder. And the PNC root provides a trust credential to all other parties in the system. And it could be managed by either a public or a private entity. But of course, this is depends on depends a lot on the country of operation and its regulation of these topics. For OEM, the vehicle manufacturer perspective, could please um, cover me if I have missed any important points. Um, the back end of the vehicle manufacturer takes care of a few very important aspects of PNC ecosystem. And one of them is the management, provisioning um, this installation of the digital certificate of a vehicle and a PCID, which are installed during the manufacturing process. The OEM also allows the distribution of the contracts with the certificate provisioning pool and the PCID. Also very important consideration is um, security module with robust security software, which is required for a charging controller to handle the security of communication between the vehicles and the charging station. But the most important consideration is the trust chain. So the charging infrastructure can authenticate itself as a trusted entity. This is provided by the PNC Root Certificate Authority and the mobility operators and the key roles are number one, um, the creation of the contract with the users. And the number two is the safe transfer of the contract to the certificate provisioning service for um, safe and efficient service operations. The reason for this is if by any chance a contract is stolen, um, this could mean that vehicle is technically charging for free, just an example of um, many other cases. To prevent um, any improper use of um, the contract by unauthorized parties, the issuance process must be secure. Mobility operators are required to establish a PKI backend that will handle user contract, authenticate the contract with the certificate provisioning authority, and verify the vehicle information with the PKI of the vehicle manufacturers. For this to work properly, the system must be ready to respond and to request for verification. This is important because digital certificates have key information, including contract owner ID, vehicle ID, date of expiration, and this has to be verified with issuing authority, which could be the OEM or the charging station operators backend. For a charging station to support PNC features, um, there are several very important things that need to be ready for everything to work. Um, the first, and the three charging, the charging station um, need to have its own digital certificate issued by the charging station PKI backend, which is chained to the PNC root certificate system. The charging station is an entity that needs to handle a lot of various certificates. So it is recommended to utilize a storage method with sufficient security. For example, a hardware security module to make sure the certificates in the system are safely and securely stored with no security breach issues. With this certificate, the charging station could establish communication, secure TLS sessions, and the station could present itself as a trustworthy entity to electric vehicles by verifying its certificate chain all the way to the PNC route. Also, the charging station should be ready to support um, the certificate installation request from a vehicle, as this process is defined by the standard and some vehicles are not capable of installing contract Set a contract certificate on their own. The one more reason for this requirement is the contract is dynamic and could be changed quite often. So charging station serves the role of middleman and must be ready to support the vehicle when it's when it needs to install updates or change change it to certificate. Plus, the charging station must verify aspects of a contract certificate such as validity, signature, and etc. This is an example role it must serve because as mentioned above, the vehicles themselves can't always keep things up to date and to keep any unwanted third parties from piggy, piggyback riding into the ecosystem through an invalid certificate with a first signature. You might have noticed a pattern. There's a pattern, but security has been a part of the old points I have mentioned because it is the most essential for any communication in ecosystem. So most stations have Windows or Linux based on operating system with minimal or no security at all. So one of my white hack hacker colleagues in Autocrypt, they have tried to um, penetrate the actual charging station 
and it took pretty much um, no effort to break through the entire system successfully. Their comment was, it is like a laptop on the street with open access, contains critical information, including private and personal. So imagine if their laptop contains tons of private information and there are hundreds of open doors, all leading to the system core and all these doors are locked with a tiny little wire. So pretty much the simple like that. So after all, it looks like um, the entire um, charging ecosystem need a proper security solutions and authentication system back end to protect the system itself and to protect ourselves from, um, from the potential breach. So that's the, my point. Thanks, Sean, for that uh, comprehensive answer and, and um, great insights there. Um, so there's obviously a lot of charging infrastructure in the ground right now already. So let's just talk uh, retrofit. And uh, we'll take one of the questions from the audience here. Um, Darren, perhaps you could take the lead on this one. Uh, what would make the charging station hardware compliant? Can existing deployed charging stations support PNC or is there a hardware upgrade required? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, it, it really depended on the, on the charger itself that's already installed. Uh, to Mike's point earlier, we were discussing the charger's ability to communicate. I think that's first and foremost. So if the charger is able to communicate uh, to the internet, either Wi-Fi, SIM card, or, or Ethernet, you know, that's the first big step. Uh, if that that's in place, then you really have to look at the hardware and firmware within the charger. If it's set up, if it's ISO 15118 compliant, you know, plug and charge capabilities are enabled. Um, for a retrofit, uh, it may be as simple as an over-the-air firmware update to have the charger updated to the to the ISO standard, and then the communicate communication ability is added in. And in some cases, it may require a hardware upgrade. So it really depends on the charger infrastructure, and the you know infrastructure owner would really need to evaluate the charger itself what that retrofit would look like if it's a you know, full hardware setting a technician out uh, versus what the new technology of a newer charger may have uh, maybe easier to swap it out and more cost effective to, to upgrade to a newer charger potentially with even more charging power uh, capabilities rather than try and retrofit an older model so there's a few variables they would have to consider and evaluate with their current infrastructure Okay, so it's it's somewhat possible depending on what you've got in the ground already. Yeah, yep. Great, um, thanks very much, Darren. Um, so, uh, Kush, um, I think you might be able to help with this uh, uh, this next question that's coming from the the, the audience. Uh, is PNC working right now in Canada? If yes, where and, and with what vehicles? And so, uh, perhaps you can speak a little about what Electrify Canada has done already to implement plug and charge and what it means for, for Taycan and uh, potentially other drivers? Yeah, definitely. So the answer is, is yes, it, it's working right now. Um, I can speak more about the Porsche side, but uh, on the other manufacturers that probably will be in their press releases and so on. So for us, it's working. Um, like I mentioned, we sell the car and we are the MSP for the customer. So they sign up in our app to use our app for charging. Um, we also are that side. And we have a relationship with Electrify Canada as a charging station operator or the charge point operator in this relationship. So when our customers drive to Electrify Canada sites, PNC works there. Um, it's on model year 21 and newer Tycon. Um, so any Tycon this year and next year and moving forward will have that uh, capability. For those of you who don't know Electrify Canada, um, it is a high power highway charging infrastructure. So it's Less common in major metros. There's one in Scarborough, and you know there's a couple in close to Montreal, Vancouver, et cetera. But um, overall, it's for those major highways that enable cross-province travel. Um, there's about 30 of them right now. I think it's 29 is the exact number. So an example from my life, I drove from uh, Toronto to Montreal this summer on Labor Day weekend. Uh, I stopped in Kingston, Ontario at the Electrify Canada charger, and I was able to just plug in and, and travel. So that's where it's working at this specific network. And on our vehicles, um, there are plans. I think you you listed a couple of brands, you know, that are introducing PNC capability in the vehicle. Um, that of course needs to be matched with PNC capability on the on the charger side. And uh, I know I answered the audience question first. Now to answer yours about what does the uh, charging station operator or charge point operator need to do? Um, just like we need to put stuff in the car production, they need to have a charger that's ready for PNC 
um, I guess, at implementation, or as Darren talked about, a little bit of, of retrofitting. Um, so that, of course, means that it has its own set of certificates, it has its own connection to uh, a backend, and that, uh, I forget the term Sean used, but I think it was a PKI authority. So this kind of third-party trusted interface to, to validate certificates, it needs that connection as well. So kind of just some planning on the technical side before they install chargers um, and installing chargers with, with the capabilities. Um, trust has been a big, a big topic today. So an example from the vehicle side of where that trust and security comes in is, I talked about how we installed at the factory. The Porsche factories in, in Germany are, of course, very secure. We're not worried about someone going in there and getting anything. Same thing with our apps and on our interfaces. A customer signs up for an account in our portals. You know, we're very happy to facilitate that. But interestingly, um, I think Sean touched on this a little bit. To get the contract that a customer has signed on for, hey, I'm Kush, I'm signing up for three years of free charging with Porsche, very excited. They do that on their phone or on their computer. They don't do it in the car. At that first charging session, when all this authentication back and forth is happening, that is when the contract um, is downloaded from uh, the back end via the charger to the car. So I think there's multiple ways of doing it, but we've seen implementations where the charging station actually helps take that contract and put it onto the vehicle. And Sean talked about it being updated. Um, exactly. If you change contract details, if you renew for three years or something along those lines, the charging station plays a role in that. So there's a trust relationship between you know, the automaker and the charging station in that process. And of course, you talk about preparation that the, the charging station um, companies, the charging networks have to do. It's really on that side is making sure that they have a robust infrastructure to facilitate these things uh, moving forward. Great, thank you, Kush. Um, Mike, just to touch on an, an adjacent topic is, is vehicle to grid. And uh, it's, it's a hot topic that generates a, is generating, generating a lot of interest right now. Um, can you speak to, obviously, uh, plug and charge does facilitate, just does help enable vehicle to grid, but could you just speak about some of the challenges of making V2G capable from a utility perspective? Yeah, overall, uh, vehicle grid is going to be a, a challenge. Um, the, the distribution systems are, and, and how a utility manages the grid um, is, is not quite ready for that. There's a lot of pilots going on right now. But you know, as an example, so you know, the, we're we're talking mostly about DC fast charging today, but um, you know that same concept can apply to fleets, can apply to to home charging. And so, it, one respect, there's there's safety issues. So if there's a, a power outage or or you're pushing electrons back in the grid, you have crews trying to fix the grid. That that's an issue. So it it requires. Um, severing the tie between the vehicle and, and say the home um, and so the, a lot of there's a electrical work required there so you know is beyond all this stuff we're talking about today about certificates and software it's you know actual physical electrical work of bi-directional meters and and being able to sever ties like that's um a significant part in addition to all this you know let's, let's call it it stuff so the the operational technology and how grids are managed and run, you know, all that has to evolve. And and, and many utilities are are aware of that, but it's it's a it's a long road and it's and it's um, um, you know fairly costly as well. So it'll the, these things will all evolve in parallel, and, the, and pilots that are happening will help inform how things move forward. But I, I think there'll be baby steps and certain scenarios. Like I'm sure many of you've seen the Ford F-150 advertising of powering your home if there's a power outage. And so, you know, I think the use case is that you, you power the home, but you don't push in back into the grid initially because it, there's, you know, there's a couple steps to take there. And, and, um, and so uh, it'll, it'll be an interesting um, you know, evolution through the, through the course of this decade. I, I, th I personally think it's going to take through the decade to sort everything out because it, there's a, a lot of complexity along the way. A lot of work to be done. Thanks, Mike. Um, and we, we've got some great questions, and we're gonna we're gonna get onto those very very quickly. But I wonder if Sean, if you could um, touch on if if we want to adopt plug and charge in Canada, what are the key considerations for policymakers and businesses from a, a technical perspective? 
Uh, okay. Um, you know, when you're looking to see um, electric vehicle manufacturers are aware, aware of the benefit of the plug-in charge and offers to electric vehicle drivers and the entire ecosystem. The electric vehicle like the Porsche Taycan, Hyundai Ioniq 5, Kia EV6, and Mercedes-Benz EQC are some of their models currently on the market, which support the PNC features. Uh, with increasing number of PNC support vehicles on the road, the debate of, um, about the PNC enabled charging infrastructure is also very active. And the fast charging station of um, you know, 50 kilowatts are considered to be made PNC compliant, but the 200 kilowatts are above the high power chargers are being manufactured with built-in PNC compatible, compatible hardware. The all new technologies are, have some problems and PNC is not so different. Some, some problems that need to be um, resolved of the technology to work with actual infrastructure and electric vehicles are facing the issues of compatibility and interoperability. It's an issue related to the PNC root certificate, which are required for infrastructure electric vehicle to establish the trust. When a vehicle decided to communicate with charging infrastructure, it utilizes its own certificate that is linked to a PNC route. So Tesla's private and closed charging network will be a good example. Not only this, what if a vehicle travels abroad or export and import, for example? So what if a vehicle travels to a different province in Canada or travel from Canada to US? Now, these use cases present a potential issue of interoperability and compatibility in line with the PNC route. So the industry is finding it difficult to decide what to do if the route certificate anchoring the certificate of a vehicle is different from one of the charging infrastructure. There, there are several what potential solutions to this issue. One of them, and one of these is a cross certification. With um, this cross certification, a variety of PNC routes recognize each other's as trustworthy. This, uh, so like allowing like for vehicles to use PNC in different reasons. The use of um, the certificate trust list is another solution but it is up to the industry to decide which one is a better fit for everybody in the ecosystem. So in my opinion, it's early to predict trend because the like this discussion and decision are still ongoing, but the technology grows in popularity and soon we need to make a decision, find a solution for the actual users. There are several trials to solve these issues considering the operation of the regional PNC routes to all major regions like North America, APEC, and Europe. I believe this is us taking the solution to um, these issues in a good direction for the industry is going. Additionally, um, in order to link multiple like service providers and see, like charging station operators, a common interface is not defined in the standard, but with cooperation and joint offerings, joint efforts from each players, um, you know, that like, like common support that would be um, handled in these issues pretty much well. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sean, that's great. Um, well, I, I think there's a, there's a bunch of good questions um, and just a couple touching on Tesla, obviously, and, and Tesla have really effectively a plug and charge system um, in that you can just drive up and, and plug your vehicle into the charger, but obviously that's a closed network. It's it's the same manufactured vehicles on the same manufactured charging. So a couple of questions here is: Would would Tesla join in this network? Um, could Tesla vehicles be able to actually come on board and communicate as part of the, a broader plug and charge network? And it's significant because they represent one third of the EVs on the road in Canada right now. Uh, would anyone on the panel like to take that one? A, a tricky question to uh, a tricky question to 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 resolve. So what, what one issue to take care of there. Okay. Um, it, it, regarding the, the 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 governmental position, and Sean, you've touched on this. Is there an overarching requirement for new vehicles sold and new charging installs in Canada to be plug and charge compliant? I'm, I'm pretty sure there isn't right now. And uh, see Mike shaking his head. Any, anyone have any comment on this? Yeah, I'm not not aware of any standard. You know, as a first step, um, like in some provinces, the uh, government funding is mandating uh, OCPP, and that you know at, that's you know one precursor. So I think uh, that is, that's a good good example of getting everybody at least on the same really deep back end communication to build off of. But I haven't heard of 
um, any any talk of mandating plug and charge at this point. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, general question for the panel. Will it make a difference if cars and chargers are manufactured in different jurisdictions or is the standard robust enough for this not to be relevant? And because it's an ISO international standard, I'm thinking not, but it'd be good for the panelists to comment on this. I mean, my, my hunch, my answer would be no, I don't think that matters because we've we've heard of this working for, um, sorry, I think I'm losing you guys. Uh, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't think that should be an issue because we've heard of chargers manufactured in different countries in, in Asia and Europe and, and North America with cars manufactured in North America and Europe all having this capability, right? Even some of the brands you've listed earlier, Nino, uh, the, the place of manufacture, the jurisdictions where they originate are, are so varied. So I, I would assume, no, the international standard really does help with that, right? Um, I think that the key to making it a seamless experience, of course, is those relationships between the um, charging station operators and the OEMs and so on, how that happens. Because like with all standards, there's interpretation at some level that needs to be done between just teams of people. So that, that's the level that really needs to be looked at. And if I could jump in just from a hardware side, I agree with Kush. I don't, I, I don't think it matters where, as long as it's you know, complying with that international standard and they're, you know, an open source type charger, I don't see an issue from the hardware side. Great, thank you, Darren. Um, I, and I think we're gonna have to make this the last question, unfortunately. Given that there are multiple stakeholders involved, is a moderator or overseeing body needed to manage the interaction between auto manufacturers, network operators, et cetera, on both the software implementation and business side? Or is it the expectation that everybody will effectively get on with it and work it out together? That's, big, that, that's a tough one. Go ahead, Mike. That's, 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 that'll be the industry conundrum, um, you know, of, of, of how, how this pans out. It's, you know, as we compared to Tesla, where you have one party can make decisions end to end. Um, in this case, it's multiple parties, no OEM manufacturers having to work together. And so it's, uh, as we've seen with other standards, it takes a while, it takes time to, to agree and then align and then people's products roll out and, and slowly um, comes to market. There's, a, there's an opportunity there for an industry body to, to take this on uh, somehow. Um, well, it, it, we, we're up against time and uh, I'm so uh, sincere apologies to everyone else who asked questions that we didn't manage to get to, but uh, enormous thanks to our panelists today for coming on board and, and sharing this new and emerging topic. Uh, Mike, Kush, Darren and Sean, thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge in this area. And uh, also would like to give a big thank you once again to Autocrypt for sponsoring this discussion. To learn more about Autocrypt, visit their webpage or contact Autocrypt's team. Autocrypt's offerings are paving the way for optimized, comprehensive automobility security. And um, you can visit their website at autocrypt.io. We will be sharing a link to a recording of this webinar in the next few days on electricalautonomy.ca. I'm sure we'll have lots of views on that because there's lots of really juicy material shared here. Uh, this webinar is one in, of a series that we're producing this fall on Canada's public charging infrastructure. Please visit our website to find links uh, for the previous discussions and look out for the one that we're hosting next week on funding for EV charges. E EV charges. Thanks very much for, for joining us. <laughs>